all so much for coming. Uh, welcome to September. I can't believe it that we're here already. We have a great session lined up for you today, and you'll leave this session knowing more about engaging with our second chance workforce and how you can best recruit and retain from this talent population. As you can see, if you want to pop to the next slide. From this slide, you can see that we're swiftly moving through this year's lineup of topics, which means that we are hard at work planning for next year. So if you could take a second and pop in the chat and let us know if there's a workforce topic that you would be interested in us covering for next year, that would be really helpful for us as we continue on with our planning out our topics. Can hit the next slide again. My name is Jessica Miller and I'm the Director of Workforce Strategy with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. And we are very, very excited that you're here with us today. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're returning, thank you for coming again. Our session will go today from uh, 2, 12 p.m., after which we'll segue into our 30 minute unplugged portion of the event where we invite you to turn on your cameras, unmute yourself and ask questions of our panelists as well as our team of workforce strategy consultants, either verbally or through chat, however you're most comfortable. I'd also like to take a moment to encourage you to fill out the evaluation at the end of our time here together today. We'll get that link popped into the, into the chat later. As always, these webinars are recorded and available to view at any time via YouTube, as well as our CareerForceMN.com website, where you will find recordings of these of this session, as well as all of our previous sessions as well, including resources and links. We'll be utilizing our chat feature today throughout our time together, so please ask questions, maybe even answer questions if you are a service provider and interact with our guests, consultants, partners, and each other. We really want to build upon the community that we started here and we welcome your engagement. I'm gonna to pop to the next slide. Our team of consultants work regionally, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way that they do their work based on the region and the employers that they're serving in these regions. But, but the common core ways that we support employers are, are the same, and they're identified here on this slide. We work with you to identify gaps in your current strategies and ensure that you are connected with your local, regional, and state workforce partners. We assist you on building strategies that will help you uh, recruit and retain talent. When you work with us, you're working automatically um, with a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state and our regions, our communities, so that your business and our workforce can thrive together. We don't do this work alone. It takes many people to bring success to these efforts. I know we have a packed agenda today, so we're going to just dive right in and I'm gonna introduce you over to James Whirlwind Soldier, our North West Workforce Strategy Consultant, James. Thanks, Jessica. That was a really nice introduction. And welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to September's Workforce Wednesday. Uh, happy birthday to all the Virgos in the room. I hope, regardless of your sign, I hope you all have a great day. Um, thanks again for, for coming. So we're here today to talk about second chancers, fair chancers, um, a term that often are, was referred to by a, a community uh, that was called by Emily Baxter, the, the famous communicator who made the TED Talk, We Are All Criminals, that these are people who are no longer locked up, but they're locked out. And what does she mean by that? She means that, what are some of these challenges? Like, you know, because of a credit rating issue, maybe because you weren't able to pay your bills while you're incarcerated, transportation might be an issue when you come out. Be, uh, because of the background check, you might have obstacles or barriers to finding safe uh, and affordable housing. Um, and and most of all, and why we're all here, you know, again, because of that background check, uh, these individuals might be locked out of a, a meaningful career, right? Regardless of their desire to to give back, to be given a second chance, to to create a better life for their children, to be tax paying, uh, contributing members of society. Um, regardless of this desire, sometimes they're just not given this opportunity. And so I am very, very honored to have a panel of distinguished guests come and talk about this exact issue. Uh, fair chance workforce, what does it look like? Um, but what does today look like? So let's go over the agenda very, very quickly. So 
regularly, we'll go ahead and introduce the panelists. We'll give them each a, a little bit of time to talk about themselves. Then we'll go ahead and enter into that roundtable discussion. We'll be able to ask questions um, right to the panelists. If you have questions come up, please feel free to throw them into chat and we'll make sure that Shayla is able to ask those questions of our panelists during the unplugged session. After the roundtable discussion, we'll, we'll wrap things up and we'll let uh, Della Ludwig talked briefly about next month's Workforce Wednesday, which sounds extremely exciting. And then we'll turn the mic over to uh, Shayla Drake, who will facilitate our unplugged session. So who are we talking about when we're talking about these panelists? The panelists we have here today is number one, Mr. Dick Owen with FairChanceEmployer.com. We have Jeanette Ruder with Martin Brower. We have Rachel Okerlund with Deed and Mark Schultz with Deed. And both Rachel and Mark are going to talk about the PROUD program. You may notice that uh, Mr. Scott College with the F5 project is absent. Um, regrettably, Scott got pulled away for some work up in Alaska, actually. One great thing about uh, F5 is that they're not afraid of doing that hard work on the ground and getting their hands dirty. And so, of course, we're uh, hoping uh, Scott the best and uh, hoping that he can come back and join us in the future. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and put his contact information into chat. And he, Scott, wants any of you who want to learn more about the F5 project to please reach out to him to learn about their employment program. If you'd like me to facilitate an introduction, I would be more, more than happy to do that. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists. And so number one, uh, first off, we have Mr. Dick Owen. Uh, the founder and I think it's the CEO of FairChanceEmployer.com. Mr. Owen, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your program? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, I'm just real happy to be with you folks today. Um, I'm a long-term and uh, time employer uh, and experienced both nonprofit and for-profit leadership. Um, I've been an HR director. I've taught HR classes. Um, uh, and for decades, I've visited jails and prisons and other venues as a volunteer, giving a presentation uh, to people on how to get a job uh, and, and with a lot of emphasis on how do you handle the criminal history in an interview. So that's kind of how I got started in this, uh, this subject matter, and it's kind of very near and dear to my heart. Um, so um, most recently, though, I've, I've launched a, a software as a service website called FairChanceEmployer.com, and it's designed for people, uh, for employers, uh, and also we've discovered for people in job placement world um, to help. Um, it's just a, it's it's a it's full of tools for evaluating justice involved individuals, and it, it introduces an innovative process that provides employers with a score sheet. Uh, you get a background check, and most people don't know what a 609.52 statute means. So it provides meaning and scoring for severity <clears throat> for severity levels. Um, so it's um, uh, which up until now uh, has been kind of elusive. People have had difficulty documenting those green rules, those EEOC requirements. But that's one of the things that we provide. So happy to be here today. Uh, love the topic, and I'm I'm. I'm going to learn a lot today. So thank you for putting this together, James. Well, we're really happy to have you here, Dick, and to hear about that program and your own experiences uh, in this space. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Jeanette Ruder. She is the Human Resources Manager for Martin Brower. Uh, Jeanette, do you mind saying a few things about yourself? Sure, absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here meeting with everyone this morning. My name is Jeanette Ryder, and I'm the HR manager for Martin Brower and Fridley. Uh, most people are unfamiliar with Martin Brower, but we are a pretty large distribution company that primarily supports McDonald's, although some of our sister locations in other states support other restaurants like Chipotle, Dunkin', Chick-fil-A. Um, I've been in HR about 25 years, with the majority of that time focused on recruitment, employee development, and employee relations. Um, so how we kind of got connected with this program is about a year ago, we were contacted by an employee from the employee program through the Minnesota Department of Corrections to see if we would be open to a partnership with the goal of helping former inmates um, have a fresh start while earning a competitive wage. After socializing and gaining support from the rest of my management team here in Fridley, we've been working together since. 
Um, I would say myself and the rest of the management team here in Fredley are very supportive of this program because we all believe in giving um, people the chance to make a positive change in their life. And we have found that the candidates that we have met with, they're very eager to work and appreciative of the opportunity. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I look forward to hearing more about uh, the pipeline, how it worked, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how it's uh, worked out in the end. Uh, okay. Next. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, sorry about mispronouncing your last name. No worries. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel Okerland and Mark Schultz from DEED. They're here to talk about the PROUD program. When you talk about pipelines, uh, this might be one that we can look at that's a, a tangible uh, process that organizations can plug into. So, Rachel, would you like to start the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, James. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. It's good to meet you virtually. My name is Rachel Okerland. And I've spent the majority of my career working as a teacher for Minneapolis Public Schools, um, a staff development lead and equity specialist. Um, and during my years of teaching, I had the privilege of walking alongside Minneapolis Public School students and their families. And for some of my students whose parents were just as involved, I was continually awed at the number of hurdles and hoops that they would jump through um, to show up for their kids and to get a fresh start. Um, so it really has been a privilege to walk around alongside families and to be a part of that support service. Um, so I've made this transition now to the state in May. I work for the Department of Employment and Economic Development, and I am an employer engagement specialist with the PROUD grant. The PROUD grant stands for Partners in Reentry Opportunities and Workforce Development. And we work to increase employment opportunities for justice-involved individuals, as well as to reduce recidivism. And I'll just add as a close, um, that I've had many members in my community who I care about deeply be justice involved. I've also had family who've been justice involved. And so this work is near and dear to my heart, and I'm really glad we're here today to have this conversation. So thank you, James, and to your team for hosting Workforce Wednesday. Thanks for, for being here, Rachel. Yeah. Uh, Mark, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please, sir? I would love to. Um, thank you for having me. I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Are we good? Oh, yes. Awesome. Yeah, we're having problems with cameras, so if you can make sure your cameras are on, that would be great. It says my camera is disabled. So I don't I don't. Can you see me? No, nope, we'll work on it on our end. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, the, there's my picture. It, it's probably the best picture of me that's ever been taken. So, um, yeah. Mark Schultz, I'm the training and development lead under the PROUD grant. Um, I actually started my career in corrections as a prison guard at Stillwater uh, and then came to DEED and, and did a couple things there. I was an employment counselor and then uh, the Southeast and South Central Minnesota labor market analyst, uh, did that for eight years. Uh, then I went back to the Department of Corrections and I worked with the employee program and actually flip flopped back to DEED now uh, with uh, this current position. So uh, I've done quite a bit uh, with the DOC and with DEED and it, it's been a great ride. I've learned a ton about helping this population. Um, the reason it's near and dear to me, uh, maybe a little known fact, uh, I did get in trouble and was involved in the justice system when I was younger, uh, many years ago. Um, and luckily, I had the support system to keep me from going down that path. Um, and I want to be part of that support system that helps other individuals who uh, are getting released, you know, find that job, uh, find a better job and and make enough money to to meet the cost of living needs and and most importantly i think find a job they're happy in um i, I think that's probably the most critical element at, and that's just my opinion so um so that's a little bit of my experience um and yeah uh, if you have any more questions we can maybe talk about them at the unplugged section yes Please, again, audience, bring your questions. I think it's really exciting that both you and Rachel have a little bit of this background that you can speak to uh, regarding uh, this space. Um, and I just wanted, you know, both of you mentioned uh, just how, you know, how it's not uncommon to be, you know, within a couple of degrees of separation from people in this experience. And so I wanted to share with you um, 
one slide with some data on it just to see uh, what people think of this. Looks like the, the data is not showing up here. Oh, here we go. Nearly half of all black males and almost 40% of white males are arrested by the age of 23. Uh, if all arrested Americans were a nation, they would be larger than Canada, larger than France, and more than three times the size of Australia. And holding hands, Americans with arrest records would circle the earth three times. And so again, I think all of us can can consider, you know, that we're not that far from a popu this population and that uh, it's not uncommon or uh, unreasonable for us to, to understand that they, they deserve a second chance and a, and a better shot at um, experiencing a high quality of life. And so uh, thank you for those introductions, everybody. And so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and just jump right into the panel discussion, if that's OK. Um, Rachel, could I have the first, could I uh, send you the first question, please? Absolutely, I'm ready. Awesome. So when I started uh, working in this space and learning about it, one thing I, I learned about relatively quickly was that at risk status that some uh, candidates uh, have. And it's from what I know about it, it's uh, a status that insurance companies give certain employees um, where they are kind of in a position where they don't necessarily have to insure them or insurance is more difficult or that sort of thing. And what this can lead to is a barrier where employers might not feel that it's the best uh, decision to hire these individuals who are considered at risk. Uh, within the same conversation, I heard about the federal bonding Thank program. Thank you for reaching out. And how this is an opportunity to our team last year. Uh, that federal, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. Um, I learned about the federal bonding program, which allows or, uh, organizations who want to employ individuals with a record to overcome this at risk, risk status, excuse me. Uh, Rachel, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to share about the federal bonding program. Um, so my boss, Jeremiah Carter, has been um, the Minnesota bonding coordinator for many years, and he's in the process of training me in. Um, so the U.S. Department of Labor established the federal bonding program in 1966, and it was to provide fidelity bonds for those hard to place job seekers that you were talking about, James. And the bond covers the first six months of employment at no cost to the employer or to the job seeker and they carry a zero dollar deductible. And the goal of the bonding program is to break down barriers to employment for justice involved individuals and other challenged job seekers um, and to give employers a peace of mind. It's very easy to get a bond. So I'll just speak quickly about that because I bet that there are people on the call that might be interested. Um, in order to get a bond, you just call the Minnesota bonding coordinator. So you'd speak with my manager, who's the program, or program manager of the PROUD program, Jeremiah Carter, or myself. You'd send an email or give us a call and we'll set up a time to chat um, and then we'll ask you a couple questions. So first we'll confirm um, that the individual that you are requesting the bond for is currently employed or has a job offer with a set um, job start date and then the bond is effective the day it is written for a current employee um, and for an employee that's got a set start date it'll be effective the day of their their start date for work. There's no paperwork to sign um, it's free for employers, and the conversation takes about 15 minutes. We handle all of it on our end. And then as far as the coverage, um, it really is determined by the business. And so coverage begins at $5,000, and it goes up in $5,000 increments up to $25,000. And that's a conversation that we have on the phone to determine um, the amount that you'd like to be bonded for. So that's a little bit about the federal bonding program. And James, I know you're going to say a little bit more about um, a statistic around claims, which I think is really important to add. Um, but I would just say to wrap up the bonding program, it's it really is to eliminate barriers of employment for justice involved individuals um, and to give peace of mind to employers. So it's a win win on both sides. And when somebody uh, is employed by that organization with the bonding program for six months after that six months, they're no longer considered at risk, right? Um, you can actually renew your bond for an additional six months, and that's up to the employer. Sometimes employers want to renew, sometimes employers are OK and they're ready to just move forward without the bond. OK, mm -hmm. thank you very much. But again, this this federal bonding program is there for employers to have a little bit of peace of mind um, regarding uh, employment of people with uh, a criminal record. And I wanted to share this uh, slide with everybody before we move on, um, which uh, uh, we will put the the source resources uh, in the chat will also share them with you at the end of today, but only 1% of employers who have used the federal bonding program have ever had to make a claim. And on top of that, 
just to keep uh, keep this in mind, 95% of businesses are actually affected by employee theft, and on average, 5% of an organization re organization's revenue is lost due to employee theft. And so uh, why do I bring this up? Um, because we can basically see by this that the employee theft that's happening, this bad behavior that's happening, isn't coming from uh, individuals um, who are, are looking for these great careers after being uh, in incarcerated. So. Uh, Thank you for that, Rachel. You provided a great uh, experience or a great example of how uh, we can overcome some of these obstacles or barriers to this conversation. Um, and I'd like to turn the next question over to uh, Dick, if that's okay, sir. Um, you mentioned that you have been in this space as an employer and a hirer, um, and we're wondering, um, you know, you've mentioned in our conversations that uh, hiring justice involved people has provided uh, different challenges. Um, other than uh, or separate from non-traditional populations. Could you take a little bit of time and talk about those challenges? Yeah, you want to throw up slide number one? You got it. Um, uh, so uh, and on a lot of these Workforce Wednesdays, if you have been to any of these before, uh, we do a good job of talking about what I would consider the five major non-traditional uh, employee populations. Uh, that being refugees, senior citizens, the BIPOC community, um, folks with disabilities, and lastly, today we're talking about justice involved. And the justice involved people are the only category in, the, in, the, in those five groups that have a lot of um, government regulations attached to them. And um, you basically have three, three hoops you need, sets of hoops you need to jump through to document all of the things that you're doing. Um, the Department of Human Rights are, is the people who enforce the ban the box statute. Um, you have the, the FTC is the organization that um, governs the background check, uh, and that those are um, a part of the Federal Credit Reporting Act. And these, this is the organization that organizations that that do background checks uh, have to follow these rules. And then the third one, the the EEOC is the government agency that governs the hiring process. So um, they've defined um, in uh, 2012 some pretty uh, they published guidelines that we have to follow if we're going to consider candidates with criminal history. So um, you don't have these in the other groups, but if you're going to be hiring folks with a criminal record, uh, these are things that you need to be um, abreast of. Thank you. Yes, and uh, we'll make sure and share these resources with you along with other resources that Mr. Owen has provided us if you want to learn learn more. Um, and so, yeah, these are really interesting you know, opportunities for us to learn of those barriers that happen on the HR side of things. Um, but Jeanette, I wanted to bring the next question to you, if that's OK. Um, you mentioned that another barrier obstacle that you, that you at least considered in your mind was that you wanted to make sure that Martin Brower uh, was culturally a supportive environment. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so while when we were first um, approached by some employees at the Department of Corrections about participating in this program, um, the first thing I wanted to do is ensure that I got full buy-in and support from the rest of my um, the rest of the management team here in Fridley, uh, because I felt like if there was concern um, about moving forward with this candidate pool, that people might be treated differently or um, just just had concerns about that in general. So what I did is I I first just got full buy-in by talking to the different candidate or to the each of the members of the management team individually one on one and just ensured that um, we had support and that we were aligned in um, wanting to move forward with the, our participation in this. And I had I really had no resistance. I would say the entire management team here is very um, supportive and understands that um, second chances are really important for people and that this could be opportunity for them. So again, no real pushback there. Um, and then I just wanted to ensure alignment when it came to expectations for new hires in this program. I want to make sure they're treated the same as every other applicant um, and that they don't have anyone looking at them more um, closely or even less closely than any other applicant. I, I really wanted them to be treated exactly the same. And I got that full support as well from, from my team. Um, and then I would say lastly, what we've we've done is um, I try to provide some coaching to 
new hires that come to us through this program. Um, so sometimes that is in the interview process. It depends if I'm a part of the interview or not, and if there's coaching that needs to um, be provided. And then if not, um, if it's during kind of the onboarding, I usually kind of pull the new hires aside and just say, hey, you're going to be asked to introduce yourself. Um, here's maybe some ways you might want to think about talking about your background or your history or whatever, um, because I don't want people to feel um, uncomfortable or disclose anything that they they didn't want to disclose. Um, so I just try and give them a little bit of um, a heads up so that they can position themselves um, correctly for entering the organization. You know, that's been a topic I've I've discussed before about how populations that might not have access to particular spaces might not know how to navigate mm -hmm. those spaces. And we're talking mm -hmm. about specifically an interview in this circumstance. And sometimes it just takes somebody to kind of guide them mm -hmm. in that right way. And so I think that's really, really great that you do that work. Um, how did you get started? So we got started by, again, we had um, some partners from the Department of Corrections reach out to us through their employee program and just asked us if this was something that we'd be interested in learning more about. Uh, we enthusiastically said yes and invited a couple um, people in so that they could learn about um, the work that we do. We really went into a lot of detail so we could really flesh out um, if the candidate pool was a good fit for us. So mm -hmm. we talked about the ins and outs of the job, the limitations. Um, uh, we are a union environment, and so sometimes that can impact scheduling and that kind of thing. So we, we just talked through that, um, ensured that we had clarity, talked through the work that they were, um, new hires would be doing, ensure we had clarity there. And then um, once we we felt like it was a good potential fit, then what happens is the um, our partners through um, the Department of Corrections will just ask candidates to apply directly to our website, and then they'll separately send us an email just saying, hey, um, so-and-so applied, and here's why I think that they might be a good fit for your organization. And then my commitment to them is I will get them an interview, and mm -hmm. how they show up and perform in the interview is really up to them and what they want to do with that opportunity. But I've committed to ensuring that they all get that opportunity to interview. If if nothing else, it's practice. Um, and so we, we've found that, that that has been working really well. And then we usually close the loop by following up with the contact through the employee program and just say, um, give a little feedback on how the interview went and maybe some things that they might do better in the future or, um, you know, just that we're ex excited to have them join the team. That's great. And employee is a state, kind of a statewide, a state program, right? With state facilities? Yep. Right. Um, well, that's really, really great. And, you know, what you're talking about here is that idea of a pipeline, which it seems like us workforce strategy consultants, especially with regard to the labor market today, are really in that business of developing those pipelines. Uh, I think this might be a good segue over to Mark and Rachel, um, because, again, just like on that state level with the employee program, the PROUD program is more uh, involved with the federal uh, facilities. And so, uh, Rachel, would you mind, before we jump over to Mark, talking a little bit about uh, how the uh, PROUD pro program works as a pipeline and, and specifically the, the stages of the PROUD program? Yeah, I can. So the PROUD program is a historic collaboration between the Department of Labor and the Department of Justice. Um, and DEED is one of the PROUD program states. There are seven PROUD states. Um, and so our PROUD program is set up to go into three different stages. We start with our participants in stage one inside the facility. So there are four different facilities, federal facilities in Minnesota, Duluth, Sandstone, Rochester, and Wasika. And we're slotted to begin programming um, in Duluth, Sandstone, and Wasika this September. Um, and during that stage one, we do pre-release programming. There's resume preparation, financial literacy. We've got um, a partnership with Career One Stop. We do interview skills, networking, professionalism. Um, it's pretty extensive. And then once our participants move from stage one, they go into stage two of the program. Um, so when participants leave a federal prison, they either go into at-home confinement or to an RRC, a residential reentry center, also known as a halfway house, to serve the remainder of their sentence. And so here is where they meet with um, our workforce folks, Isaiah and Christine, who are um, going to be working alongside them to develop an individualized employment plan. 
um, where we do job placement assistance. We talk about short term and long term goals, identifying barriers, um, and then connecting with support services that are in the community and the support services that are part of the program. Um, so that's stage two. And then once individuals are no longer in um, BOP custody, they move into stage three. And the idea of the program is that we're really following them and being that support system throughout the entire journey. And so they're not being dropped off at any point. And so stage three is in the community and that comes with additional career coaching, housing assistance, supportive services. Um, and I know that it has taken a village to raise me and I have a lot of support services that I have needed um, from my community. And so proud really is has been designed to be a part of that supportive piece for folks that are going through that process because those transitions are huge. Um, and when anybody goes through a transition, you need you need somebody there. And so that's a little bit about the proud program. Thank you so much. And I just want to encourage everybody to reach out to Rachel or Mark um, or any one of our guests if you want to learn more because uh, it's, they're very open and willing to talk about this this good work that they're doing. Uh, Mark, if it's OK, I want to jump to you um, and this program seems great, uh, but who is actually eligible for the proud program? Yeah, the eligibility um, originally uh, we had a, a shorter time frame, but we we found that uh, the number of individuals releasing to Minnesota, the number wasn't quite where we wanted it to be. Um, so we are now looking at anyone with two years or less until release uh, in the federal facilities um, that are releasing to Minnesota. Um, and the nice thing, and, and talking about partnerships um, with, with the PROUD grant, is that because our Minnesota numbers weren't quite where we wanted them to be, um, we're partnering with the other states also um, in, in that um, if, if an individual is incarcerated in Minnesota but is leaving to another proud state, we can provide those initial services while they're incarcerated for those individuals. Uh, and then they can continue uh, in the second and third phases in the uh, proud state that they, they release to. Um, and uh, another nice thing is that uh, all the incarcerated individuals are eligible for the job search training classes uh, that we'll be putting on. Um, and, and we have a wonderful staff. Uh, we, do, we have Casey Cropper. Uh, she came from the Department of Corrections and prior to that education. We have Cody Wilking. He came from the Department of Corrections. And we have Cheryl Torito who came from, she actually worked at the two reentry centers that are part of phase two of the grant. So those are the three that will be going into the facilities to teach these classes. And so, um, yeah, that's that's who's eligible. That's great. You go right into the facilities and you start offering these opportunities for people. Um, that's so great. Um, when you when we were talking, you, Rachel and I earlier, um, did I hear Rachel say that this was a historic program? Uh, yeah, it is. This is a uh, first of its kind partnership between the Department of Labor and Department of Justice, um, and then, of course, the seven states that were involved. Uh, so it's uh, it's kind of new to everyone, you know, which uh, brings about you know, certain challenges also. But um, yeah, the, the first time that there have been uh, this collaboration between the two entities, uh, and I think that uh, just based on what I've experienced so far, um, this collaboration or this partnership uh, is going to open a lot of doors for this population. Um, and that's one of the goals of the program is to increase the partnerships between the workforce and the kind of corrections community or the, the, the criminal justice entities. So, um, yeah, first of its kind partnership um, and, and Man, I, I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm really pumped. Uh, I haven't yeah. been this this pumped about something in a long time, and uh, we're going to do some great things in Minnesota, uh, just as I'm sure all of the other states are going to do some wonderful things. And I hope that's going to open up opportunities to the states that didn't make it into this initial proud uh, uh, cohort. 
Man, this is exciting. I, I can feel your energy coming through my screen right now. Um, I think this is another great example of that pipeline, right? Where you have services before individuals come out. So they're getting they're getting employment ready. They're getting to a competitive place where they can go after some of these roles. And then you have these services afterwards to help people, including with, with employers like Jeanette mentioned, giving that coaching and helping them kind of mentor wise, guiding them down that path. Uh, I want to change the subject here just briefly and go back to you, Dick, if that's OK. Um, it sounds, you know, a lot of these conversations we're having, especially today, are around that uh, that background check uh, that we were uh, that we all have to kind of utilize as we're employing people. Um, but you've talked before about the band box statute. And what I was hoping is if you would mind briefly talking about uh, that band box statute with us. Sure. Um, you slide number two. OK. In fact, I think I'll have you go to slide number three. So that's the actual statute for the ban the box law that came in uh, uh, to uh, Minnesota in uh, 2014, I believe. So the, the the problem with this statute is it's not written very well. And, and you talk to many HR attorneys like, uh, and they'll go, oh, gosh, we just don't like the way it's written. And let me just read that. Uh, from A, right underneath the heading, a public or private employer may not inquire into or consider re required disclosure of criminal record uh, for applicant for employment until two things. The applicant has been selected for an interview by the employer, or if there's not an interview before a conditional offer of employment is made to the applicant. So that's not written very well when it says selected for an interview. That's just not, it doesn't send the right message because it doesn't, if that were true, then I'd say, hey, Della, you know, you can you come to an interview tomorrow at three? And by the way, bring your, your criminal history with you, you know, because I've selected you for an interview. What that means is, and if you go to slide number one or slide number two, uh, that the part on there, this is from the Minnesota Department of um, um, human, human Rights, and they've clarified that in the in, in the narrative they show um, where I circled it in red, and it says uh, uh, cannot provide it provided that it, it occurs that the, the background check occurs after the job applicant has been interviewed. So that, that that's a clarification. That's that's something that I see a lot of people really confused about. And whenever I've talked to um, an HR attorney about uh, when we should do the background check, they always say the same thing. It's a poorly written statute. If all you remember is just wait until after you have a signed job offer, then you do the background check. That's the proper order. Mm -hmm. OK, and that's kind of the band the box. Yes, statute that's the band of box statute, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, speaking of some of these rules, I'd like to jump over to Jeanette, if that's okay. Uh, Jeanette, at the beginning of our conversation today, you mentioned again one of these barriers uh, to uh, employing people with a uh, criminal record are some of these union specific scheduling rules. And I think when you and I talked about this <clears throat> before, you'll have to. Uh, fill in the blanks here, but sometimes people uh, on parole have specific hours they can or can't be away, um, specific rules regarding you know, when they have to go to meetings and that sort of thing. Uh, and these sometimes these union specific rules can cause obstacles to employing these individuals. Could you uh, talk to us about how you were able to kind of uh, bypass those obstacles and move forward? Yeah, sure. I would say for us, the biggest obstacle has been um, so we are a union environment and um, uh, periodically we can get into situations where overtime is mandated or forced. Um, and that's all seniority driven. So this obviously um, would impact new hires that come into the organization because they wouldn't have seniority. So they could be quote unquote forced to work overtime and they don't really have an option. If they don't work the overtime, it's going to negatively count against them from an attendance perspective. So in order to ensure that they had the opportunity and would not um, be, it would not have to be put in a situation where they could potentially get in trouble for not um, getting back to their place that they're staying and time or whatever the case may be, um, we've just developed some workarounds. Um, so for example, if an employee comes into work and they learn once they're here that we are mandating overtime, um, we've created like some little cards that that employee can give the supervisor that just says, please call this number at um, call this 
company at this number and let them know that this person has been mandated to work overtime and what time they will be ending work at the end of the day or something to that nature. So it really, um, you know, it doesn't cause any extra work or extra consideration. It takes my supervisor about one minute to place that call and just say, hey, so and so is not going to be done with work at 10 p.m. as expected. They're instead going to be done at midnight. Um, and then then everything's taken care of. So they again, the the um, people still have the opportunity. They're still able to work under the contract in the same rules as everyone else, which is this minor little tweak um, of us taking this maybe one extra minute to accommodate something that they need. Nice. Well, I, I think that's kind of a trend right now with regard to employment in general is I think before, you know, five years ago or even more, it seemed like there was kind of a, you know, we would push people through the, the recruiting and hiring funnel, right? And just kind of move them through. But now it seems like because we have to create these pipelines and because we have to be much more intentional and deliberate about hiring individuals, it feels much more of a personal thing, right? Mm -hmm. Just like Mark and Rachel talked about, and just like you talked a little bit about uh, the employee program, you're, you know, you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that are sending you individuals saying this, we, this person might be a good candidate as mm -hmm. opposed to just pushing people through a funnel. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really, really great. Um, I think that's going to be a trend for a lot of different demographics as we move forward. Now, I saw a question in chat about the difference between misdemeanors and uh, other felonies, and I was wondering, uh, Dick, would you mind speaking to that a little bit? Sure. Um, um, I think as I interpret the um, question, it's it's a bit like, do you request a background check whether they have a felony or misdemeanor? Um, and again, you should wait till after the job offer is signed. Uh, then you run the background check and, and you do it for everybody or everybody in that class of employment. You know, you might have um, office people that you don't or um, whatever, but you, you have your own internal standards for who gets the background check and who doesn't. Most places just give them to everybody uh, because then that that follows the treating everybody the same overarching rule in the HR world. Uh, we design all of our processes so that we are not guilty of treating people differently. So you, you order back if you go, if you get some back on checks, you just get one for everybody and then you're covered and, and then you discover what's on the history. So you're saying don't even worry about the different. Yeah, levels or whatever, because it'll do it'll show up. Uh, on the background check, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, um, you you know there's all kinds of uh, background checks you can order, financial records, uh, uh, DOT or you know, do, you know driving records, all kinds of things that you work out with your background check company based on the job that you um, you're you're interviewing for. You know sometimes people don't have driving duties, so you would not want to check their driving history for that type of person. But so you get one for everybody and then that that report tells you what their history is, whether they have a felony or a misdemeanor. And then that way you're 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 treating everyone the same. Wonderful. Uh, if you have any other follow up questions, please feel free to throw them into chat or within 15 minutes we're going to be jumping over to our unplug session. Uh, Jeanette. James can yes, I just please. tag on, um, and I'd be interested in Dick's perspective on this as well, but I would also say um, I would recommend that an organization have a matrix for um, the different types of um, convictions and what the the organization wants to handle um, for how long they if if a position is included or excluded based on a conviction of some sort so that you don't run into a situation where you're ac actually looking at somebody's background and just doing an evaluation on that person and then let's say six months or a year later you are looking at another background and they may have something similar and they might have ha be handled differently so by having a matrix that sort of spells out different types of convictions and whether an organization is able to accommodate or not, I think that that makes it much clearer for everybody involved and takes some of the human error out of it. Mm -hmm. Did you build that matrix from scratch or was there a, a model you used? Um, there's there's a lot of models out there. Most okay. companies, I, I did see a, a uh, question in the chat as well around background checks. Um, most companies that have a background check policy should have a matrix to go along with that. And I think there's a lot of different um, samples available. 
Um, but I, I would encourage people to really take a look at just because a sample says something, don't necessarily automatically go for that. Really look at what your business is and say, does this this prohibition or allowing this really make sense for us as an organization? What's the real risk here? Because the reality is um, to the point that James made very early on in um, the presentation, a lot of people have something in their criminal background and that does not preclude them from being a really great employee. Right. Well, I'm mean, glad that there's those uh, models out there. And someone did ask if you had the matrix at Martin Brower. I would invite that individual to reach out to Jeanette or, or chime in during our unplug session because I'd like to learn more about that too. Um, Dick, yeah, I'd like to bring you back into this conversation because it sounds a little bit about kind of similar to what the fairchanceemployer.com uh, matrix sounds like. Yeah, yeah, it does. And and before I get going, uh, if you're looking at the chat, you'll see some answers by a person by the name of Donna Plouffe. I brought Donna Plouffe in as a ringer. She's the she's the person I go to for all my answers, and the, she works for a background check company, trusted employees. So uh, she's the expert. And uh, if if I, I think she'll probably stay on for the for the unplugged if people have more questions, but she's just an outstanding uh, resource. So, but anyway, on the matrix, you're exactly right. You need to have some way to figure out uh, what this particular statute, how it um, applies to a particular job description. That That's part of the EOC green rules, right? So, but what you wanna make sure that you don't do is you get so stringent that you start making blanket statements like we won't hire anybody for this job if they have this kind of, um, uh, offense. Uh, now, the common sense, you know, the common sense we have to use, like uh, if someone's, uh, I, I think Donna even mentioned if, if you have someone who was embezzling, you wouldn't want to hire them for your finance department. If you have somebody with a couple of DUIs, you don't want to hire them probably as a driver. There's probably other places in your organization that might work that way. So we are allowed and, of course, encouraged by the EOC to make that kind of call. Of course, what, what fairchanceemployer.com does is it, it provides a, a, a score sheet based on the uh, EEOC guidelines uh, for uh, different states. I have Minnesota and, and uh, Wisconsin loaded right now, but it gives you a score based on the severity of that crime, how it relates to the job description, and how long ago it happened. Thank you. And people can reach out to you, Dick, to learn more about that. Yes. I think when we talked once, you even mentioned that there are a few people that were utilizing it who actually had criminal re backgrounds or criminal records getting their own score to bring into interviews and that that might be a good tool for people looking for work to just get in front of all of this um, as it be more proactive as opposed to reactive. Yes, um, and we may talk about this a little later, but uh, I've got some folks in the job placement world that are, are using our website to put those reports, the background check and the uh, our score sheet in the hands of uh, a job seeker to take to the interview. So they're they're helping coach the employer on what this actually means because most people most of us can't look at a background check and tell us what a 609.52 theft for a felony means. Uh, you know we don't understand those things, but the, I mean that's what my website does, um, and the um, the um, uh, individual, however, cannot request their own background check through a background check company. That, that's that been the, the hitch lately. So they have to go through an organization of some kind. Uh, and uh, I've been working with a couple of three uh, organizations just lately to uh, help them use our website to provide that uh, job seeker with the tools they need to help train the employer. So again, if people want to learn more about that or, or, or check it out, please reach out to Dick. His website is uh, will be in our, our resources. Um, we're actually coming up to the end of our conversation. Can you all believe it? Um, I want to share one last uh, slide with some data on it so that we could talk about uh, just keep, keep in perspective that these are, are human beings we're talking about. And again, people who are looking to improve the quality of lives of their children and get a second chance and, and make amends and move forward in a productive, effective way. Um, We'll share these uh, sources for this information in our in our uh, chats, but you'll also get it in, at the end of today. Um, this report was done by Brookings, where they talked about only 55% of people coming out of incarceration reported any earnings in the first year. And the median was $10,090, right? We're talking like $5 an hour 
they're making. 4% earned less than $500, and that's full time. 4% earned less than $500 in the first year. 32% earned between $500 and $15,000 the first year. And only 20% earned more than $15,000. So we can see that, you know, above and beyond all the other obstacles, whether it's transportation, uh, senior kids again, getting reconnected with family and, and creating a, a, a new life for yourself, um, employment is extremely important. And even the employment that a lot of individuals are getting isn't enough to help them pick themselves up and remove themselves from maybe uh, some uncomfortable situations or from uh, uh, people that maybe uh, aren't as, as healthy or as uh, positive as, as they could be. I just wanted to throw this chat, uh, this message out here and, and talk to the group about this specifically, and maybe even Rachel. Do you see this sort of impact on people you work with, this financial impact? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, like, especially right now, a lot of people are hit financially, um, but finances are huge. And that's a part of, like, when we look at stage two of the PROUD program, um, we're really trying to walk around and walk with a participant and make sure that they are getting a job, not just a job, but a job that's a sustainable job uh, that where they can sustain their family, they can sustain a livelihood. And so that's a that's a big piece of the program is not just getting somebody a job um, at Chipotle, which there's nothing wrong with working at Chipotle, um, but you're not necessarily going to be able to um, carry yourself financially. Um, and when we look at participants' long-term goals, um, we want to find a job that they're going to be able to achieve those. Um, and so in that stage two of the PROUD program, really identifying what are the short-term goals, what are the long-term goals. Like say we've got a participant named Doug, that's a made-up person. Um, and Doug has done some, some assessments and Doug knows that Doug loves working with his hands. He doesn't necessarily want to be in an office setting, wants to be outside, enjoys working with teams. Um, a apprenticeship in highway heavy construction might be perfect for Doug, and that's a a job that's going to give a a stable financial future for Doug. Um, and so that would be something that we would we would do in the prog program. But yeah, that's a huge that's a huge piece. It's not just about getting a job; it's about selecting a career that you are interested in, um, that you care about, um, and then making sure that that career is something that's sustainable. Does that get yes. at what you were asking, James? 100%. Oh, good. 100%. That sustainability thing is, is huge. Um, and I wanted to, to mention one last thing and maybe, maybe uh, throw this out to Jeanette. I think it was when you and I were talking last, we had the conversation about how oftentimes this population is more uh, punctual, consistent, mm -hmm. again, because sometimes their, their uh, parole status requires work, so they don't want to do anything to risk that that opportunity. Mm -hmm. These are individuals that are keeping themselves clean um, because, again, of the, the parole statuses. Uh, am I right in saying that that was the conversation that we had, Jeanette? Yeah, absolutely. And I would add to that that um, I feel like uh, the population that we brought on is also more receptive to feedback because they do um, appreciate the opportunity and they want to be successful. Yeah, you talked about, I think you told me a story about uh, a recruit at one point that uh, made a small snafu in an interview, but through your yeah. guidance, you know, mm -hmm. and I think we talked also just about how that response was so positive because it mm -hmm. was so, you know, it wasn't uh, brushed off or, uh, you know, there mm -hmm. wasn't an aloof response to it. It was a serious, and that kind of was an interview in and of itself, right? Seeing how mm -hmm. somebody can internalize that sort of feedback in a positive and valuable way. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to expand on that if you'd like. Please, absolutely. Yeah, so um, in general, the department managers do the interviewing for open positions that we have in that department, but occasionally if they are unavailable, I'll step in and interview in their place. Um, I will, um, the example that James is referring to, um, I had a candidate who I um, interviewed because the hiring manager was unavailable. And um, he he kept his earbud in the entire time that we were having an interview. Um, normally, that would be something that would be a red flag. Um, you know, how you show up to an interview is important. It's very telling. Um, however, our, our conversation went really well. And I felt like this is somebody who wants to make a change. And this is an opportunity that can really help. Um, to Rachel's point, like pr provide people with um, sustainable earnings that are going to change their life and change their family's life. So I didn't feel like something as a, such a small infraction as wearing an earbud should 
preclude him from that opportunity because let's be honest he just hasn't had experience lately and maybe doing some interviewing mm. so we went through the entire interview process and at the end i just said hey you know i i i liked everything i heard i really want to extend a, an offer to you i said but but this earbud thing like you, you can't have an earbud in an interview that would normally be something that i would i would make i would pass on you for i said however um i understand that you you haven't been doing a ton of interviewing lately so I'm willing to just kind of give you a pass on that and he was just like oh my gosh i'm so sorry i forgot it was in nothing's been playing you know and and it was how he responded to my feedback also he didn't become defensive or try and turn the table. I've had those situations with candidates. And so just knowing that he was receptive to feedback um, also, in my opinion, really kind of helped put him over the line. And we extend an offer and he's been a great hire for us. Yeah, that's a great story. And, you know, just thinking about that impact, right? Thinking about giving him that that one extra chance and that ripple effect. You know, I, mm -hmm. I see that often that sometimes if you can just give somebody a, a a fair wage, right? All of a sudden mm -hmm. their sense of self-worth increases, right? They start mm -hmm. thinking to themselves, wait a second, I'm getting paid this much time an hour. My time is valuable, mm -hmm. right? And, and and that can be a game changer for someone just cognitively about you know, mm -hmm. who they are and what they can contribute to society. Um, but thank you, uh, panelists, man, we're out of time. I can't believe this. We could have probably extended the conversation or isolated each one of you for your own Workforce Wednesday. Um, I know we have a lot more to say. Um, so, uh, and I know you have a lot more to give. And so again, I want to invite our entire audience to reach out to our panelists, uh, facilitate a conversation. If you want me to help with that, I am more than willing to do that. But this is going to continue to be a big conversation as we move forward. Um, and I expect a lot of great things to continue to happen, especially because of the individuals that we were able to, to bring in here today um, and talk about some of this. And so uh, without further ado, I would like to turn over the microphone to Ms. Della Ludwig. Uh, who will talk a little bit about next month. Great. Thanks, James. Great conversation. Wonderful information. Um, even though we had a little technical difficulties, we figured it out. And thanks for being patient with us. So I am the Workforce Strategy Consultant for Central Minnesota. Um, we hope that you join us again next month on October 4th. Our Workforce Wednesday will be on automation and upskilling our workforce. Uh, the event will be a special roundtable discussion that will be led by our deed commissioner, Verilic, and a small group of businesses uh, to commemorate Manufacturing Month. So join us for an engaging discussion to learn about strategies for growing and expanding your organization through automation, upskilling your workers, and fostering a diverse and inclusive workforce. Um, we'll throw the link in there for you so you have that information right there for your um, upcoming event. And then um, the next slide, we just wanna uh, thank everybody for attending um, and uh, we want to take a second for you to fill out the survey for leveraging second chances um, for better workforce um, and take a minute or two to complete the survey on how we can continue to grow our workforce Wednesday events. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to Shayla for our unplug session where we turn off the recording, we unmute our mics, and we turn on the cameras for everybody to participate in an open conversation. Uh, please give us a quick minute to do this for this transition. Everybody is welcome to continue to stay on, and uh, we'll get that survey up for you right now. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, stay mm -hmm. online. Any questions at this time, give us a minute and we'll get right to you.